Hi, I'm Pastor Kent King Nobles, and on behalf of all the wonderful people from the normal First United Methodist Church, happy Father's Day, welcome to worship. In 1786, a former slave named Richard Allen returned to Philadelphia and became an assistant minister at St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church. Now, if you went to that church in the late 1700s, you would think of it as a progressive Methodist church. It wasn't that unusual in the Methodist movement at the time to have preachers who were African American, and the congregations uh, were sometimes mixed. That one certainly was. As Richard Allen was working in the church, he began to attract more and more African Americans, uh, freed slaves and, and slaves to the church. And so the church needed to expand, they needed to build. So they decided what they would do is build a balcony. When the balcony was completed, as, the, as Richard Allen and his associates and friends came into the church, they were told that now they would need to be seated up in the balcony. And one day as they went up into the balcony, they sat down in the places where they thought they were supposed to sit, but as soon as the prayer had started, an usher or a section came up and asked them to move, that that section was reserved for whites only. Well, Reverend Absalom Jones, one of the associates with Richard Allen said, we'll move as soon as the prayer is over. But the usher said, no, you have to move now or I'll call and get help and we'll force you to leave. Well, they waited till the prayer was over, but then Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, all the African-Americans there walked out of the church and they left and they founded another church which would become the African Methodist Episcopal Church, a place where they didn't have to be subservient, where they didn't have to be second-class citizens. You know, since our beginnings as Methodists, we have had courageous Christians who have stood for justice and have stood for God's vision. But we also have to lament that we have been complicit in accepting things that are not part of God's vision and treating others as second-class citizens. As we worship today, let us seek God's will to be the, creation, the courageous Christians that God is calling us to be in our day and time. Let's worship together. We're glad you're here.
The call to worship today will be in two parts. The first part I'll read, and the second part, please join me with the words that you find on the screen. Come, let us remember the great things God has done for us. Let us not neglect to teach our children the greatness of God. Let us not forget our past and those who have gone before us. We remember our ancestors, our history, good and bad, and we name our future. Let us lift up our voices in song and open our hearts in gratitude. Let us greet God with our praise. And now please join me in the opening prayer. Almighty God, we come to worship you today with open hearts and open minds. We want to hear and receive what you have to say to us in this service. Speak to us today as you spoke to those who went before us. Tell us the stories of your wonders and greatness. We are ready to hear them. Remind us once again of your grace and love. Help us teach your goodness to our children and the next generation. Amen. Let's keep on learning about confidence with Miss Jill. So good to see you virtually for our worship today. We are continuing on with our life app on, that's right, confidence. And confidence is learning to love yourself the way God loves you. Learning to, to see yourself the way God sees you. And when we have confidence, we can make the world a better place. And today's Bible story comes from the book of Judges, and it's about a guy named Gideon. Now, this story is pretty sweet. I like it because Gideon is just kind of a regular person like you and me. Like, not a prophet, not, you know, some big scholar, just a kind of regular person like you and me. And God uses the story in Judges, the story of Gideon, to, to demonstrate how having that confidence of knowing who we are, made in God's image, we can make the world a better place. Okay, so the story is talks about a time when God's people, the Israelites, had turned away from God. They decided to worship other idols, and they had turned away from God, and God had taken their land away and given it to the Midianites. 
And so every time the Israelites would try to farm or plant crops or do something on the land, it would die. It, it just, it, it didn't turn out well. For seven long years, this was going on. And God gave Gideon, this Israelite, this regular person like you and me, a, a vision, a dream, a, a purpose to bring the Israelites back to God. Now, Gideon, if like if I were in Gideon's shoes, I'd be very nervous. And he was. He was nervous. He didn't think he was up for the job. He asked God to send tons of signs. And God performed all these different miracles and signs to show Gideon, I'm choosing you. I'm choosing you to bring my people back to me. So Gideon trusts God with all of these answers that he's asked for. And he gathers this big army of Israelites. And God says, no, we want a, a smaller army. We want a smaller army for lots of different reasons. I want you kids to go into the book of Judges and, and read about the story. Um, but anyway, Gideon has this small army of Israelites against this big army of Midianites. He's nervous. He's still trusting God. A lot of the Israelites were afraid and they kind of went home, which made the army even smaller. Anyway, God gives Gideon this dream to kind of go spy on the Midianites to see what they got going on. And then Gideon kind of overheard what some dreams and some, and some things that the Midianites were gonna do. Long story short, Gideon is prepared, he's ready. He gets his small army ready. And long story short, the Israelites ended up defeating the Midianites. And then God gave the land back to his people, the Israelites. Now Gideon, the story of Gideon is to remind us that God can use you no matter what. God can use me, you, anybody no matter what. That's our bottom line. Say it with me, kids. God can use you no matter what. Yeah, you don't have to be straight A student, top athlete, getting all the awards. None of that matters. God can use you no matter what. So maybe that means you're going to stand up for somebody or that, you know, that kid that everybody picks on. Maybe you're going to stand up for that kid. Or maybe you're gonna take on a project at home that helps your family. Maybe you'll come up with a creative solution for something that's wrong here in our own community. There is no limit to what God can do in kids too. Let's say our bottom line one more time. God can use you no matter what. God can use you no matter what. I love you. I miss you. I pray for you all the time. I can't wait to see you in person. Have a great rest of your week. And remember, God can use you no matter what. And have confidence knowing that you are made in God's amazing image. Have a great day. Bye. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God bless the reading, the hearing, and the teaching of these words. Amen. So if you're a Christian, what are you supposed to do? Jesus gives us instructions at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, for example, the Great Commission. What does Jesus tell us to do? Go out into all the world to make disciples of all the nations, to baptize them, and to teach them all that Jesus taught and Jesus commanded. So what did Jesus teach and command? What is the good news that we share? We are to share the good news to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to open the eyes of those who are blind, 
and to sit at li- set at liberty all those who are oppressed. So how's that sound? Does that sound easy enough? You ready to go? Got your marching orders? Now don't forget, Jesus doesn't send you or I out alone. Jesus sends us out together to work as a team and remember the great promise of Jesus. Jesus says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. We don't have to do it alone. What we're called to do is cooperate with God, but God does have tasks for you and me to accomplish. Now, it's tempting for some of us to think, well, that job's over. I mean, surely everybody in the world has heard of Jesus by now, so, so we don't have to do anything. It's up to them to accept Jesus or to not accept Jesus. The truth is, even many people who have grown up as Christians, grown up in the church, even people who have grown up here in our church, don't fully understand, haven't fully heard who Jesus is or what Jesus is all about, don't fully know the depth of God's love and grace. There is good news that needs to be shared. My fellow Christians, a good deal of work lies ahead for us. This weekend, we celebrate together a holiday, a holiday that some call our nation's second Independence Day, Juneteenth. On January 1, this was 1863, African Americans gathered together in churches and private homes all across this land, waiting for news that the Emancipation Proclamation, signed by who? By Abraham Lincoln, had taken effect. And at the stroke of midnight, prayers were answered and bells were rung and all the enslaved people in Confederate states were declared legally free. Now, you know, in spite of the Emancipation Proclamation, in spite of the celebrations, that not everyone was free on that night. There are always those who stand against freedom, who want to delay justice, who want to preserve the status quo. In the Confederate state of Texas, Slaves were kept from hearing this good news about freedom. It would be two long years before freedom would finally come to those slaves on June 19, 1865, when 2,000 Union troops arrived in Texas and went forward to spread this good news. The Army announced that the more than 250,000 slaves living in Texas were by executive order free. This day, Juneteenth, came to be known as Juneteenth, and that's what we celebrate this weekend. Now, I think it's tempting for many of us to believe that slavery was always just an accepted part of the world until recently, recently when we became more enlightened. The truth is more complicated than that, though. The truth is there have always been those who have fought against slavery and not accepted it. When the first slave traders showed up on these shores, there were Christian leaders who said that these colonies should not have freedom, that it should be a slave, I mean, I'm sorry, that these colonies should not have slavery, that it should be a slave-free zone. Of course, there were other powerful forces who worked to enshrine slavery into the fabric of our nation, and we know who won out. It's about courage, and it's about complicity. Sometime in the 1770s, John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement, wrote a pamphlet entitled Thoughts Upon Slavery. In this pamphlet, Wesley is very clear. He calls slavery barbaric. He said it's not part of God's will. He tracks the history of slavery and notes that slavery as a common practice was on its way out, partly because of the spread of Christianity. He noticed also how the discovery of the Americas led the Portuguese to start hunting slaves in Africa and and others to join in to get people to do the plantation work. Wesley said very clearly that it was selfish pursuit of money that led to slavery. Wesley tells some of the arguments that people who consider themselves good Christians made for maintaining the institution of slavery. They said, African slaves come from a dreary and barren land, so it's a kind of kindness to deliver them out of it. Wesley kind of laughed at that. It's a kindness to take these people and, and put them in the hot sun to work all day long. The slaves are uncivilized people, they said. They are inferior, inferior and deserve to be enslaved and even like being slaves themselves. Wesley countered this by going into great detail to describe the riches of the cultures 
and the people in Africa at the time. And I'm reminded of that quote by Abraham Lincoln who said, you know, those who think slavery is such a good idea should try it themselves for a while. The people said slave traders are simply buying war prisoners who would be otherwise killed by their captors. Wesley pointed out that many of the wars that were being referred to were started by Europeans as a way of separating and gaining power. The people said slavery is a way to Christianize the heathens and bring them some form of salvation. Wesley took on each of these arguments in his pamphlet and he destroyed these as false arguments and laid bare the real motivation, the using of others solely for the desire of personal gain. That's what's behind slavery. Wesley is clear that this institution not only oppresses God's children, but it's corrupting not only on the slave, but also on the slave owner. He declares that freedom is the birthright of all human beings. And Wesley warns that those who support this cruelty and oppression will come under the judgment of God. Through this pamphlet and through other preaching and teaching, Wesley was persistent in encouraging Methodists to free every slave they could, encouraging Methodists to do all they could to end slavery and, and to get the scourge off of the face of the earth. He urges Methodists and others not to respect unjust laws, but to focus on the laws of God. John Wesley shared his vision of freed slaves living side by side with colonists, free to learn and flourish and, and to make the contribution that God had given them to make. So there have always been courageous Methodists and Christians who have understood that God is on the side of freedom and of freeing the oppressed. And there have always been ways in which we as Christians have been complicit, used to counter the will of God. We have to lament that many white Christians not only failed to fight for black freedom and equality, but often worked to support slavery and racism. The Christian church, including our Methodist church, has been used to support oppression and the institution of slavery. From pulpits all across the South, but also across the North, many preachers have been apologists for racism and for slavery. Christians have been used to provide a rationalization and theological justification for slavery and racism. There have always been courageous Christians who have fought slavery as abolitionists. There have also been complicit Christians who said it was illegal to teach slaves to read the Bible. There have always been courageous Christians who risked their lives to leave slaves to sanctuary and freedom on the Underground Railroad. There have also been complicit Christians who said that people with black skin could come to church, but only if they stood in the back or up in the balcony and knew their place as subservient second-class citizens. There have always been courageous Christians to join civil rights movements against Jim Crow and segregation. And there have also been complicit Christians who said, now is not the time. We need to do it gradually. We need to not upset everybody. We shouldn't have big changes. People who've been willingly blind to the discrimination and suffering of others, even as they enjoyed privilege. You know, some of my own relatives might have been some of those Christian people in Texas, keeping the good news of freedom and emancipation from those slaves in Texas. My own grandfather believed what he was taught, that people with black skin were the descendants of Ham, and the black skin is the mark of the curse of Ham. Now, biblically, if you really study the Bible, this is just ridiculous. It makes no sense. But it was commonly taught as a justification for the mistreatment of people with black skin. It's just another example of using the Bible to support our own prejudices and our own desires instead of letting the Bible judge us and speak to us. We have to live with the sad fact that there has been a tremendous effort in our nation to spread racism and racism has been planted deeply within the fabric of this great nation. Racism is like a virus that gets in deep and has to be sought out and destroyed. Just this past week, I heard another story of institutionalized racism. Maybe you heard the story. Remember the NFL concussion scandal? Well, the NFL you know, set aside money to compensate players who had severe medical issues due to repeated concussions playing in the football in the NFL. 
This past week, I heard on the radio that a couple of former NFL players were suing the NFL and protesting that they received less money than their white counterparts simply because of the color of their skin. Black former players have been automatically assumed through a statistical manipulation called race norming to have started with worse cognitive functioning than white former players. So this is just something that has been written into our medical code for a long time. That if, you're, if you have black skin, you're going to have weaker cognitive abilities, so you need to be compensated less for damages. We now know about institutionalized racism. We now know about the wealth gap. We now know about the health gap. We now know about extremely high rates of incarceration. We know now about modern day school segregation. We must accept as Christians that we have compromised with racism. As Christians, we have too often been complicit. We must lament that and we must repent of it. We must fight against the temptation to forget the past and say, well, let's just start from here and, and not talk about unpleasant things from the past because the past is the fabric of the present and it's the context for the present and the future. We must study and understand the past. We must understand white privilege. We need to hear and understand the harm that has been caused. What we need is intentional and creative efforts to break down the racial barriers. We need perseverance to deal with racism. You know, the default way of thinking for many of us white-skinned people is to focus on the re relational aspects of race and to think that all will be well if we just have black friends. I think friendship and conversation are necessary and very important. They're good, but this is not enough to deal with the racism in our nation. We must track down the racism inserted into our institutions and our cultures and take it on deliberately to eradicate it. It doesn't help for us white people to say that we are the real victims here, that over 400 years of slavery and Jim Crow and racism should not be that significant to our brothers and sisters. God does not call us to be protectors of some mythic white Christian Protestant culture. That's the KKK who, who believes that. That's not the vision that Christ gives to us. So what am I asking of you today? I'm not asking you to apologize for who God created you to be. I'm not asking you to apologize for the color of your skin. I'm not asking you to shrink. In fact, I'm asking you to grow as a courageous Christian. I'm saying that we all need to make sure that we are being who God created us to be and acting as God wants us to act. I'm asking you to follow the golden rule. I'm asking you to confront the sins of our past and present, both individual and societal. I'm asking you to humbly pray for God's direction on your life. I'm asking you to accept God's vision of all of God's children living together in respect and love. I'm asking you to share the good news of freedom. I'm asking you to check yourself again and again to make sure that you're acting as a courageous Christian and not as a complicit Christian. So let us work together against the forces that are trying to hold on to a racism designed to keep some of our brothers and sisters down. I'm convinced that God is acting us, you and me, to take some very deliberate and courageous actions now. You and I, we are part of God's solution. We are part of God's plan for freedom and good news. That's how we celebrate Juneteenth. Repentance, listening and learning, and courageous action empowered by God's Spirit. So let freedom ring out. Let us go forth to share the good news empowered by Christ. Amen. We have an opportunity now to come together as a faith community and to join our prayers together. What is it that we need to pray for today?
Let us go to God in prayer, knowing that God is listening to us. Oh God, we thank you for hearing us today. God, we know that Jesus was so often filled with compassion as he encountered the sick, the grieving, the lonely, and the tormented. As disciples of this Jesus, we pray to you now for those we know of who are facing hardships, and we lift them up in our minds. God, we pray that you would use us for your purposes. Help us to grow in our faith. Humble us so that we may learn to listen to you and to follow your plan. God, let us be courageous Christians, empowered by the love of Christ. Forgive us where we have been complicit and followed a lesser, more selfish way. God, on this Father's Day, we give you thanks for all of the love and guidance our earthly fathers have shown us. We pray today for fathers everywhere. Being a father is a high calling, and God, it's not always easy. Give all fathers not only courage and wisdom, but also perseverance. Let us learn from our mistakes. Let us be willing to love deeply. Help us to pass on your love and grace to those under our influence. God, we thank you for the gifts of being a father. We remember fathers that we miss today. We pray for those who have painful relationships with their fathers. God, help us to accept each day as a gift with you and not to spend our lives worrying about the past or the future too much. And now change and direct us as we pray the prayer that Jesus himself teaches us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join us in singing, Lift Every Voice and Sing.
Richard Allen and the African Americans went to St. George's Methodist Church. They were told they'd have to sit in the balcony and in a certain section. That was not a proud day for us as Methodists. But if you go to St. George's United Methodist Church today in Philadelphia, you'll find that there's a change. That the church members there now have sought out those who have left and formed other denominations and that they work together like during Holy Week to come together for greater understanding. They work together in a lot of ministries and missions. Our past is not all proud, but we can overcome the past to be who God is calling us to be. As we go out this week, may we all be open to hear God's calling, and may we do what God calls us to do to make our world better. Hope you have a great week. Look forward to seeing you next week.